I want to say to the world here and now, dating is anxiety provoking. It is. And it cannot be anything other than that. You're meeting someone for the first time. You have hopes that this might actually be the one, be your person. How would that not be anxiety provoking to some degree? Now we can use the tools you and I've talked about today to minimize that, to get more grounded, to be more composed as you guys talk about, to think more clearly and rationally. But to think that you're not gonna have some butterflies on a first date is ridiculous, it's irrational. (laughs) So we need to approach dating from a more measured and calm and psychologically flexible. Welcome to Love and Life. I'm Dr. Karen Anderson Abril here with my co-host, Pastor Elliot Anderson. And Love and Life is your place to hear conversations grounded in psych research, psychotherapy, and biblical truth to help us thrive in love and life. Recently, I was invited to speak about anxiety on the podcast Redefining Resilience. The host, Kylie Schmitz, also wanted me to address anxiety and dating. And as someone who spent 27 years on the dating scene and has worked with many women looking for love, I know a good amount about how anxiety can block us from our goals in love and life. Elliot and I wanted to share this conversation with the love and life community too. Whether you're trying to manage anxiety in the context of dating or dealing with it in another realm of life, my discussion with Kylie Schmitz of Odyssey Resilience is for you. Let us know your thoughts. And if Elliot and I can support you regarding anxiety, dating, or any other concern, please let us know. My conversation with Kylie Schmitz of Odyssey Resilience right after this. We are thrilled to announce our partnership with Authentics Athletic Apparel, spelled with two X's at the end because it's our XX chromosomes that make us female. And contrary to current belief, No amount of hormones, no number of surgeries can change that. And no female athlete should have to compete against men. But at the moment, this is exactly what's happening in both amateur and professional sports. It's not fair, nor is it safe. Wearing Authentics lets us take a stand to support and protect female athletes. And I don't think it's hyperbolic to say it, we're protecting the future of womanhood. Authentics gives 10% of all sales to the Independent Women's Forum, the nonprofit which fights for women's causes, including our right to our own spaces and our right to compete against other women and only other women. Check out Authentics.com and use promo code LOVELIFE for 10% off your purchase. That's Authentics.com, A-U-T-H-E-N-T-I-X-X.com and use promo code LOVELIFE all one word, for 10% off your purchase. I am here with Dr. Karen, and I am super excited. I have had Dr. Karen on previous podcasts before, and I was on her podcast, Love and Life. And I am so excited for this conversation because I feel like Dr. Karen has, I know Dr. Karen has, (laughs) Tons of great wisdom, perspective, academic training, practical training, and I'm really excited to hear what your thoughts are on anxiety. And we're talking about anxiety because as it relates to our ability to keep our composure and also then think clearly, which is part of the reasoning domain, anxiety is something that I don't know what the exact numbers are, and you probably can speak to this. I feel like anxiety has become more and more common in today's world because of COVID and the attachment we have to our cell phones and just this busyness that we all live in on a day-to-day basis. So maybe to start, Karen, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Just give us some high-level overview of where you're coming from. Yeah, so I started my career as a therapist. So right after undergrad, I went and got my master's in clinical psychology, which is basically training to become a therapist. And then my first iteration of my career, I was in the inner city, actually in in the child welfare system, seeing kids who'd gone through obviously a ton of trauma, uh, neglect or abuse of some sort, which is why they were in the child welfare system in the first place. And I did that for several years. Then I did some more inner city work 
and then went and got my doctorate in developmental psychology. At that point, I wanted to move from the clinical practice to becoming a professor is the word I'm looking for. <laughs> I wanted to move to academia. And I did that for 10 years, the first five years, again, in the inner city context at Chicago State University. Then I moved to Concordia University, Chicago, where I was teaching in the grad program, then teaching people therapeutic skills and tools, a lot of teachers who wanted to become school counselors and also community mental health counselors. So that's the gist of my background. Then I left academia when I got married and moved into this kind of self-help domain and uh, relationship stuff. Having been married myself later in life, I got married at 42. I took issue with some of the messaging out there that single women hear all the time that they're too picky or they're too intimidating and that's why they can't find a man. And so I wrote a book called Single is the New Black, Don't Wear White Till It's Right. And I started pivoting toward that domain. And then again, with the podcast, trying to let people know that I had a word of encouragement and empowerment for them. And now here we are. <laughs> yeah. And I love the word empowerment because when I think of you, I think of empowerment and taking personal responsibility for your life, for your you. love life and <laughs> your relationships and just creating the life that you want for yourself. Mm -hmm. And we are super aligned to that from an Odyssey resilience standpoint and the message that we send on this podcast. So I wanted to have you on to talk about anxiety because I think one, it's running rampant in yes. our country today and across the world, actually. It's not just us in America. It's all throughout the the globe. And little, a little bit later on in our conversation, we're going to dig into anxiety and how it shows up in dating and relationships. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit right now on just anxiety in general. How do you describe anxiety? So it's obviously, to your point, you've made some excellent observations about the current lifestyle we live in the technology that we're engaged with at all times. Certainly COVID didn't help anything. We talked right before we started recording about childhood, how it's quite different even from 15, 20 years ago. So anxiety is pervasive. It's something I think we all understand as an emotion. And we tend to think of our emotions as being housed in our brain. And certainly that's true. There are neurotransmitters, which send messages from neuron to neuron. And these are involved in emotions but it's very much more complex. And we know that because it's not just your brain. When you get anxious, where do you feel it? Oftentimes you get butterflies in your stomach, right? You get sick to your stomach. Maybe you even have some GI issues if you're really nervous. You uh, maybe can't eat or you're eating too much. So we know that it's a holistic physical experience, also emotional. So it's really hard to kind of pinpoint what is anxiety, but we've all felt it. And we all know that sometimes it can seem to be out of our control out of our ability to manage. We know that in the brain, anxiety is going to be part of the amygdala. It's going to be part of the system in our brain that is uh, more animalistic, so to speak. So it's less evolved. The frontal cortex is where we have that rational, logical, able to be calm, think through a problem, anticipate the consequences. The anxiety is housed in that more primal area of our brain, the limbic system, where we're just like reacting, the fight or flight kind of responses. So we feel it on so many levels, emotionally and physically. And I do want to take issue, however, with some of what we're seeing in the common discourse. We definitely have levels of anxiety. You look at any metric, any kind of survey, any kind of research that's out there. But we've also, as a culture, we've really stepped into a biomedical model, meaning that we frame and diagnose the myriad human emotions, which make us human, and we often pathologize what is really in a reasonable response. So for example, people will say, I have social anxiety. Well, most people are nervous to enter a room full of people at even a cocktail party where they don't know anyone. That's not social anxiety. That's called a normal human response to a novel situation. And so we have a lot of this discourse that concerns me because, as I said, it medicalizes normal responses. Public speaking is one of the, is, is always rated as one of the top fears. Mm -hmm. Now, for people like me who've been a professor and people like you who've done keynote speaking, that's maybe not the fear that would be for someone who hasn't had that experience. 
But to then say, oh my gosh, there's such an uptick in anxiety. Yes, I do think there is some based on the, the factors we talked about a moment ago. But I also think we have to consider when we have this conversation that we have medicalized much of the range of human emotions. And I don't think that's empowering, A. I think it's actually very dehumanizing and lacks empathy. Yeah. Well, and it sends the message that we are helpless mm -hmm. and hopeless. Yes. Without medical intervention. Mm -hmm. And there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Yep. <laughs> and and so the the message I really want to send to people listening is we do have the ability to use tools and tactics organically that can help us lower our anxiety, lower our cortisol levels and yes. and manage the difficult situations that may give us anxiety, but they don't need to overpower us. They don't need to own us. We can keep our composure. Yes. As your as your prongs, one yeah. of your main pillars. So completely resonate with that so strongly. And I think it's a word that needs to continue to be discussed. It's a notion that is not being at the forefront of the conversation. And it's so disempowering, Kylie, as you said. The word that comes to mind, and I have a great book to share with your listeners called Cleaning Up Your Mental Mess Ooh. by Dr. Caroline Leaf. And she provides a very structured approach to helping move toward exactly what you said, strategies that will allow you to, if you do get these panic attacks, this overwhelming anxiety, and that's another thing, people will use terms in a colloquial conversation that don't make sense. People are not having panic attacks just because he didn't call back when they texted him. They get hyperbolic because these terms, which I do think came from a pure place of trying to raise mental health awareness, trying to help people. But then these terms become and then people adapt them in, into their vernacular and they're saying, oh, I had a panic attack yesterday. You didn't. If you had a panic attack, you would literally think you were dying and you probably would have gone to the ER. Right. Okay, the fact that you got keyed up and overly emotional is, that's not a panic attack. Let's right. and again, that's not. It's it's very unempathic to someone who truly has those kinds of experiences. All right, back to my point. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to your point, there are strategies we can take, and I borrowed this term from Dr. Caroline Leaf. When we have this neuroreductionistic, so getting those neural pathways we talked about, the neurotransmitters. When we reduce it, we say, "Oh, your anxiety is because, or your depression is because you have low levels of serotonin." It reduces the human experience to just these chemicals bouncing around in your brain, suggesting that, oh, you have a chemical imbalance, which, by the way, has been totally debunked, has been for years. In fact, honest psychiatrists never subscribed to the low serotonin related to depression and anxiety model that has been there for a long time. But that model, that, that medicalization of depression served Eli Lilly quite well in order <laughs> for them to sell Prozac. And this is very cynical of me to say, but I think very honest of me to say, as a psychologist, I feel an urgency to let people know that much of the research that is out there on this topic of depression and anxiety is funded by pharmaceutical corporations. They have, they have an, they are the beneficiaries of us all believing that we have these conditions that again, neuro reductionistic conditions that are, we have a broken brain and it can only be fixed with medication as opposed to what you're saying. We can have lifestyle strategies that make dramatic improvements on our emotional well-being. Well, and the interesting thing about the brain is that it's a muscle, so it can grow. And different parts of your brain, the limbic brain that you talked about where our, our anxiety lives, it actually can grow. And so the more anxiety that you feed into, essentially, the more anxiety you're going to feel. And it's this vicious cycle that if we don't recognize that we can put a stop to it, that we have control. And growing up, no one ever told me I can control my feelings. I can control how I manage my emotions. No one told me that I can control how I react to situations. I just thought that when I felt an emotion, it was outside of my control. And I just had to like ride the wave until it was over and find something that made me feel better. Well, the find something that made me feel better was food or it was alcohol and numbing. And that proved to be 
something that kept me in this cycle of anxiety and depression almost. I wasn't diagnosed with depression. I was diagnosed with anxiety at a period of time in my life where I was going through a big change. Mm -hmm. And like you said, that big change is just a normal part of life that right. like was hard at that time. And so for me to say, oh, I have anxiety, it's not a permanent diagnosis. I might have had anxiety at that snapshot in time in my life, but it had to be worked through and I had to process the emotions in a productive way so that I could get myself to the other side. But I don't think that there's enough of a narrative out there that you are actually in control and you can do something to help yourself. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, this is why we love <laughs> talking about all this stuff because we align on all this and it's just true. And it is so troubling that we are not teaching young people or old people or middle-aged people exactly what you said. And this biomedical model reinforces the notion that there's nothing I can do because it's just the way my brain is wired. And to your very important point, we can rewire our brains. We are able to strengthen the connections that bring us joy and happiness and contentment. It's truly a pathway. When you think about it, the neural pathway that we spoke about earlier with these neurotransmitters that are going from one neuron to the other, that is like a, a, a pathway. Think of like a path in the woods. The path that people have walked a lot is gonna be well-worn. And it's going to be easy to walk that pathway because there's been thousands of people before you. When you take the path that's a little bit harder to go through, maybe that path is smaller. It's not as strong as far and, and solid. This is the same in your brain. So if yeah. I keep going over and over again with these negative thoughts about whatever the case may be or for single people, as I was for a very long time, I'm going to be alone forever. I'm going to be alone forever. Well, that thought is going to lead to a lot of depressed feelings, right? Because it's a very disempowering, very sad notion to think that we're, we're wired for community and to think that I would not find my person if that's my heart's desire. That's going to make me depressed. When we take that thought that we want, the, the thought that, that empowers us, the thought that brings us joy, the th thought that brings us peace, and we make that the path that's well-worn yes. by, by rewiring up. And it's, it's a discipline. Kylie, and I know you're all about that because you're into training and Chris is too, and that's his thing. And so you, it's a discipline, the way you discipline your body. An athlete puts his body in very uncomfortable situations. We have to do that with our mind. So when we feel anxious, we say, okay, take a beat. I don't want to have this thought. This thought is not empowering me. This thought's probably not even true. It's probably what we call in psychology, a cognitive distortion. Yep. It's probably a lie that we've been telling ourselves. And we purposefully, in that moment, redirect our thinking to an empowered thought, a thought that is probably, like I said, more true and will bring us joy and peace and let that pathway be the one that's reinforced time and time again. At first, it's going to feel phony. You'd be like, no, I really believe this lie. I just do. I believe this lie. But as you train yourself, you fake it till you make it, it gets easier and easier, just like when you're trying to do some push-ups. Yeah. And it's so interesting because we were having a conversation with Chris's brother, who is interviewing for a really cool new position. And he's like, man, I don't know if I'm going to get it. And it was like, well, what is the worst case scenario? And he's like, well, worst case scenario is I don't get the job and I love my job now. So it, it really wouldn't be that bad if I didn't get the job. And I also said, you know, there could be an alternative here that you may not want this job, right? And so that's an alternative thought, too. And mm -hmm. then what's the best case scenario? Best case scenario is you get this job and you love it and it's a great transition for your life. And then what's most likely the scenario? Well, you're probably going to have a really good conversation and you're going to have a feel at the end of that conversation whether or not it went well or if it didn't go well, that's okay because you've already said that it's really not that big of a deal <laughs> if you don't get it, right? right? But we walk ourselves through yes, because our brain is naturally going to go to the worst case scenario. So we have to retrain it to think about best case scenario mm. too, right? If we're only thinking on one half of the coin, we're doing ourselves a disservice because it's not giving us objective perspective. So that's that cognitive bias that you were talking about yes. that our brain has a tendency to default to. So when we can 
say, hey, you know what? I'm going to think about the possibilities here too and what kind of opportunity could come from this. And, you know, we have to also think about what's most likely because at the Mm -hmm. end of the day, most likely it's going to go well. Right. (laughs) Especially if you anticipate and put that energy out there of, I believe this is going to go well. Because we've all had that problem or that situation where we've had to go to a party or something and we're like, I'm not in the mood and I don't know anybody. I'm not having fun. And then you go with that energy exactly what you expected to happen happens. Yeah. Sometimes you hype yourself up, you put on some music, you're like, I don't know anybody, but I'm going to have some fun. I mean, that's a reality too. But I loved your point, what you were teaching him. And this comes from, and you may have another name for it, but in the therapeutic realm, we talk about psychological flexibility. So you were helping him be more flexible in the possibilities. And instead of getting locked in, like we were talking about taking that path of it's, it's going to go badly and da, 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 and you helped him. And this is from ACT, which is acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a cognitive, it's a third generation cognitive psychotherapy, which is really powerful for people who find themselves stuck in these, like you said, the, these cognitive distortions, these, again, lies, they're lies. I, I like to sometimes bring it down to just the ultimate truth is that a cognitive distortion is not true. And we entertain them in our minds, which they're very easy to do. We are living a lie. So this is from Dr. Stephen C. Hayes's work, and he's the founder of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy, which they call ACT. And he's been on my podcast twice. So if anyone's interested in that, they could check that out on Love and Life. But yeah, psychological flexibility is very, very helpful. There's other tools we can use. One of my favorite is called Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy by Dr. Albert Ellis. And this one's act is a little bit more zen. Like you get distance, you defuse from your thoughts because sometimes your thoughts do seem to be out of control and you can't control them. So you try to take a step back and realize, okay, this voice in my head that's thinking this thing let me get defused from it. Because sometimes we think our thoughts are ourselves, but they're not really. We can look at it more, like you said, objectively and go, that's an interesting thought. And he, Dr. Hayes even recommends that you name that. Oh, that's that, maybe that mean girl that is in a lot of our women's heads. That mean girl that's telling me I'm too fat. My, that mean girl that's telling me I'm not enough. That mean girl that's saying I'm not as cute as that girl or my dress is not as pretty, whatever the case may be. And just maybe you give her a name. Let's not call her Karen, by the way. Karen's have taken a hit recently. I happen to have an IN because my father was half Norwegian. So I, I kind of, Kylie, I'm going to start calling myself Karen because that's the Norwegian pronunciation <laughs> because really, <laughs> it's been rough. Anyway, don't call the mean girl in your head Karen. But <laughs> Dr. Hayes, he recommends naming her. So I don't know. I don't want to give her a name because someone out there will have that name. But and, and Or just call her mean girl. And just be like, that's interesting, mean girl. And you can talk to it. I, that thought is my mean girl talking to me. And then you can have a little empathy even for the mean girl. You can say, I know you're trying to protect me. You're telling me that I'm not good enough because you want the best for me. It's a really twisted way, <laughs> but you want me to have more in this life. But your approach isn't working for me. So even just by talking to that thought in your head, you defuse. Now, Albert Ellis with his REBT, he gets real, he gets, he gets in the ring and he puts on the boxing gloves. I love this one because I'm kind of combative, I think, by nature sometimes. I had two big brothers. You know, I had to. It was survival of the fittest in my home. So I, when I have an irrational thought come in my head, and this happened to me a lot when I was single all those years, I'm going to be alone forever. You know, example I brought up a moment ago. I would just tell myself, and Albert Ellis just tells you to identify and then speak to that, dispute that irrational, what he calls belief. Mm-hmm. And he says, to your point about a snapshot of time does not, it's irrational to think that because you had anxiety for a snapshot of time, a season of your life, that you're for sure going to have anxiety for the rest of your life. That's just irrational. Anyone knows that. We change. Yeah. Humans grow. Tomorrow, something that you've been dreaming and hoping for could magically show up. Right. I, mean, I wouldn't say magically because I believe in God, but so he says to dispute. And so I would take issue. I'd be like, well, that's irrational. That's irrational to think that. And then you replace it with a rational thought. Just because I'm single right now does not mean I'll be alone forever. In fact, it's really irrational for me to think that because here's a rational belief. I have a lot of friends who love me. My family loves me. It's very, it's actually more likely that I'm going to find a man who loves me as well. And so you can do these exercises like we were talking about earlier that can concretize what feels out of control. All this free floating anxiety. There are strategies. And it's again, like we said, put in a little work with it, get disciplined about it. But if your mental health matters, 
How about be empowered about it and say, yes, I can take charge of this instead of going, oh, well, I guess I have a broken brain. Better get on some meds. I love that. I love what you said. And I know the concept that you're talking about in NLP, it's called disassociation. Okay. Where essentially you take yourself out of the first person. Yes. Seat, yes. And you go to a third person perspective where you're like the observer of what's going on in your life. And yes. it takes the emotional attachment and creates distance between it so that you can think more rationally. And you're almost like, watching your life in an arena and you're a spectator mm. and when you you take on that position you can be a little bit more objective with how you're interpreting and you can dispute and discard some of those beliefs that and right challenge them get your yep. boxing gloves on and <laughs> challenge some of those thoughts so that you have a more productive or constructive outlook on your situation because you're right. Whatever you believe, you're right. Mm -hmm. Whatever you believe, you're right. Because our brains are hardwired to go look to confirm our beliefs. So if you believe you're going to be single for forever, you're right. Because you're not going to be in a headspace where you're going to attract that kind of love and affection from somebody else. You're going to be looking for reasons why that person you met at the library or the person you met at the coffee shop isn't going to be interested in you. Oh, she's cute, but there's no way she'll be interested in me because I'm I'm meant to be single for forever. Well, you're right. So you're not going to ask her out. You're not going to, you know, have a conversation. You're just going to be awkward and probably like say, oh, sorry, I bumped into you. Right. Instead of striking up a conversation and say, I don't know, this may be forward, but if you're single, would you want to grab coffee with me sometime? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and having worked with a lot of single women, Oh my gosh, they are craving men to step up in those ways. But yes. to be fair to the men, I think third wave feminism has thrown a lot of those conventional approaches to dating out the window, which has been, I don't think, so helpful because people don't know their roles and men are afraid that if they approach a woman, it's going to be sexual harassment. There's a lot to that conversation as well. Right. But I want to get back to the NLP. I don't know a lot about NLP. I've heard of it, of course, but that's interesting. It's very aligned with ACT, it sounds like. And I do, when you talked about the third person, it reminded me of a conversation I had on my podcast with a neuropsychologist. Mm -hmm. And she recommended as you're trying to grieve or process any kind of experience that's been negative that you've gone through to journal in the third person for exactly the reason you said. It gives you a little more empathy for yourself. And it actually, she talked about the neuro pathways. And again, I don't remember off the top of my head, but it is research based that it's more healing and therapeutic to journal in the third person, which I thought was very fascinating, but totally tracks with this NLP research you're talking about. Oh, I love it. Yeah. It's all about, I, I mean, the brain is so fascinating because yeah. we interpret language in our brain. And that's really what NLP is all about. Neurolinguistic programming. It's how our mm -hmm. brain interprets language. So what you say to yourself really, really matters. And one yes. of my most favorite books is The Four Agreements. Yes, and yes, yes, yes. It, one of the things that he says is be impeccable with your words. Mm. And you have to be so impeccable with your words because I truly believe at the heart of anxiety are the words that we tell ourselves. Completely agree. When you were talking about it, it just goes back to why I said earlier, I will call them lies. I don't even want to dress it up necessarily as cognitive distortions. They're lies. And so it gets back to be impeccable. It's not true, but you're playing around. You're playing with fire because you're playing as if it's true. And then to your point earlier, you're going to whatever you believe is true is true for you. And meaning that your life is going to go according to that truth in quotes that you've ascribed to. And why would you ascribe to something so disempowering? Why would yeah. you do that? It is in your control. And now it's going to be harder for some people. We know that. Like you said, you wish someone had pulled you aside when you're little and said, hey, you don't have to feel a certain way. You can actually, in this moment, you can change your emotions. And some people, well, we have phrases in our, in our language, getting back to language. I can't help how I feel. Yeah, you can. Mm -hmm. One of the most empowering things I ever learned was the idea that no one can make me feel anything. When you're little, mom, he made me mad. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. Something happened and you had an emotional response. 
He did not make you have that emotional response. Now this, again, it, it's going to be harder for people who've gone through trauma and, and they can get triggered at things. But to say that you went through A, B, or C, and that means you will always feel D, E, and F, is, it's just a lie. And we know so many success stories from people who I'm sure you will have on your program or have had on your program who have gone through things we can't even fathom, but they've been able to embrace this philosophy for living and make huge strides. And of course, those are the stories we love to hear. Those are the, the from rags to riches and not monetarily I'm speaking here, but from maybe a raggedy, <laughs> unfortunate, painful upbringing to a life full of, of richness in and wealth in all realms, meaning emotional relationship, wealth, connection, and fulfillment thriving. As I talk about in my podcast, we want to thrive in love and life. And those are the stories we love best because they give us hope that it's possible for us as well. Well, and I love what you said. It's not about surviving. It's about thriving. And the path to getting there is resilience. That's why Odyssey yes. Resilience exists. That's why we started this podcast. It's because it's actually absurd to think that with all of the convenience and modern day technology that we have, that not everybody could be thriving in today's mm -hmm. world. Mm -hmm. We have the abilities. We have the resources. We have everything at our disposal. It's up to us to use it and go from just surviving in life and getting through it. Right to thriving and truly enjoying the life that you have created for yourself. And I say you have created because you truly, wherever you are in life right now, there's no one else but you responsible for where you are right now. Yeah. And that might be a tough pill to swallow. It feels like it for some, I think. But Kylie, I totally agree with you. And I've heard it put this way, and I'm not going to quote this exactly right, but I think it's it gives the empathy piece that when I say things like that, sometimes people, I feel pushed back because they're like, well, you didn't go through, I mean, goodness knows, a, a father that abandoned you or being molested by someone as a child. And I've heard it put this way. You were not responsible for anything that happened to you in your childhood. But as an adult, you are responsible for the rest of your life. I mean, no one's coming in to save you except Jesus. <laughs> but but other than that, well, yeah. And again, like getting back to a holistic approach, that's why my podcast, we talk about mind, body, and spirit. And we can't possibly thrive if we don't address all of these. And here today, we're talking quite a bit about the mind and our mindset and what we allow in our cognitive realm and our thinking and our thought patterns. But then the body is related to this. There's so much research about processed foods being related to anxiety. Seed oils are rampant there in everything. We, we need to eliminate those. I have a, a Shanahan doctor, but I'm, I'm not remembering her first name now. But anyway, she was on my podcast talking about the hateful eight seed oils. And then I do believe that a connection to God is important too, to give us that hope when life is just so rough to believe that there is a God out there that, that wants the best for us. Yeah. And when I went through one of my hardest breakups, which was one of my snapshots in my life where I was really, I mean, I, I wouldn't say depressed because I had already started that mindset work where I'm like, I'm not going to even label this as depression because it's yeah. impeccable with my words. If I run around, I am depressed. Well, what the heck am I going to be? Of course, I'm going to be depressed. Right. But yeah, but yeah, so I was working at that point in my own life and just and realizing that I needed to recognize that this is a season and I'm going to move through it and I'm going to move through stronger. And what, one of the things that I leaned into was the work of Joel Osteen who is a huge advocate of hope. And I know when you talk about pastors, people can get, have a lot of issues. But for me, I would listen, because I couldn't let my thoughts, like we talked about today, I couldn't let my thoughts run rampant because they were going down negative rabbit holes all the time because I was very much in love with this guy and it didn't work out. So I had to literally tell myself, Karen, I can't trust you driving out from, I lived in Chicago at the time. My family was in the suburbs, driving out to see my family. I couldn't trust myself in the car for 45 minutes in an hour. I had to put on CDs. This is way back. <laughs> CDs of Joel Osteen sermons because I needed someone else to help guide me toward hope and faith and belief. I couldn't trust myself at that time. And so again, that's that holistic approach to leaning into the resources we need. It really is a holistic model. Mm -hmm. I don't think we can take one of those elements away from the equation and expect to thrive. And I love what you said, because finding the right resources is so essential to getting help and making progress for yourself. And even just 
going through a bad breakup and talking to somebody like you who got married later in life at and not you're not even 40s is not even old anymore. 40s no, is like the new right. 30s. But <laughs> even just talking to you about my situation made me feel like, OK, you know what? If I have to wait a few extra years to find the right person, I'd rather find the right person and just enjoy my single time leading up to that point than sit here and sulk and go to the depths of despair thinking I'm hopeless. And so it's talking to you and just reading your books and knowing that there's somebody out there in life who had to wait also made me feel like I was less alone and I was less unique in my situation. And when you feel like you're in community, you have support networks that can lift you up and give you the hope and the the faith maybe that you need in order to think positively about what the future holds for you. It's when we get to a place where we we feel hopeless and we don't see evidence of improvement out there that we start to get really depressed or we feed into the anxiety and we can't pull ourselves out of it. And, you know, whether or not you believe in God, just believe that the universe has your back. You know, we are a collective of energy as humans on this planet and everything on the planet has energy and the energy all works together to create this beautiful world that we live in. And at the end of the day, it's our human desires that create angst and create negativity for us. And so it's up to us to see the good aspects of the world. And sometimes when we get into a place where we're super negative, everything is negative. And we can't we can't discern between what's good and what's bad anymore. And it's just all bad. And so you have to believe that there is good in the world and you have to look for it. And you brought up the community piece, which is huge. And that's this is something that also can be rough. And I think this is something that also the people who spend a ton of time online and also we use technology to disseminate a podcast like yours, my podcast. I used to be pretty busy on Instagram promoting my podcast, believing that I had something encouraging to, to share, something empowering to share. I do. But I also know the research that the more time we spend in front of a screen, and it doesn't matter, any screen, is related to depression and anxiety. Mm -hmm. Full stop. So social media was supposed to create community, getting back to your point. It hasn't worked. In fact, there's research on this. There's a whole body of research called Facebook depression oh. that looks at why people who are spending a lot of time with their social media connections aren't feeling the benefits that we feel from in-person connection. And that's now research-based, that we don't feel that same intimacy. It doesn't give us that boost in our emotional well-being that having a community does. And I fear that, again, getting back to what we talked about earlier, labeling ourselves, oh, I have social anxiety. Let me go find some group online that also has social anxiety, and then we'll all commiserate. This is not the community you want to be spending time with. Yes, get some empathy. Yes, get some support. Maybe go to a therapist who's an empowered therapist, not one who's going to like, oh, yeah, let's keep you ruminating in your social anxiety identity. Let's get right. you a around a community that is uh, going to lift you up, that's going to believe in your potential, that will believe that this may be a season you're dealing with, a snapshot in your history, not definitive of the rest of your life. When you're around people like that, your potential will go leaps and bounds because of that social support you talked about. Yep. Oh, so true. Okay, I want to switch gears because we've touched on anxiety and relationships and dating, but I think we could go a little bit deeper in this. And I talked to a few of my single friends and got some questions. All so right. I'm curious, what are some of the dating trends that you're seeing now in today's world? Yeah, so obviously the apps have really taken over dating. And that's not a bad thing. People do meet people through the dating apps. And that can be great. They can also feel very dehumanizing. The swiping, there's the process of no, 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 no. So I think people feel commodified a bit. The it's women are transactional. It's, it's very transactional. Yes. yes. And I mean, so many <laughs> paths we could take with this. But Kylie, I think we would, as women, we have seen that social media and getting back to the Dr. Jean Twenge research I talked about, we do find that girls, now thinking adolescent girls, young girls in their 20s and 30s, 
they use social media differently than boys. And so they do a lot of comparison, comparing themselves to others. We see now that women feel that they have to look perfect. They want, I mean, we have people going to plastic surgeons saying, can I look like this filter? I don't like how I look, but I like this filter version of me. So we have what I think some of the basic elements of male female connection are now exacerbated mm -hmm. by technology, by social media. And it's like you said, transactional feeling commodified, feeling that it's not the personal connection, even though it can be a tool to getting a personal connection to happen. So I don't want to paint it as a horrible tool. It can be a nice tool, but that's the trend that we see. We also see getting back to today's conversation, we see the trend of pathologizing normal dating experiences. Like I have a lot of women in my community who will say something like, I know I have anxious attachment. Okay. Well, as we've talked about, that's a, that's a, a, a label that suggests that in every relationship that you experience, you will always have this anxious response to it. I want to say to the world here and now, dating is anxiety provoking. It is, and it cannot be anything other than that. You're meeting someone for the first time. You have hopes that this might actually be the one, be your person. How would that not be anxiety provoking to some degree? Now we can use the tools you and I've talked about today to minimize that, to get more grounded, to be more composed as you guys talk about, to think more clearly and rationally, but to think that you're not gonna have some butterflies on a first date is ridiculous. It's irrational. <laughs> so we need to approach dating from a more measured and calm and psychologically flexible, like you did with your your boyfriend's brother. Is that who you were talking to about the job interview? Yeah. We can take that same kind of skill set to to a first date, for example. So those are the kinds of trends that that I see and that also trouble me a bit. What are some best practices or suggestions you would have to the single folks who are going through it right now. Okay. So the things that, and again, this is coming from someone at 34, I called off an engagement two months before the wedding. I was back on the scene. Sex in the city was very therapeutic at the time. I was like, I need <laughs> to see a model. Like you were talking about earlier. You need to see a model of someone who's been through something like this and has come out the other side. Okay. So yeah, I didn't get married till 42. So every configuration of relationship I experienced, I broke hearts. My heart was broken. Uh, been there, felt that is what I always say. But when you're in the trenches, you really have, and it gets back to mindset, Kylie, because it always does. You either go, again, this is horrible. I mean, I hear this, I, dating's horrible. It's not worth it. Forget it. Okay, that's an option. Then you need to really change if, if you're dating because you're wanting to meet your person and you want to partner through life together with someone, with your soulmate, hopefully the love of your life. And I don't think that that's being overly romantic. I think that that's what most people deeply desire. Mm -hmm. If you are dating for that purpose, then part of that is picking yourself up and dusting yourself off and moving forward. And when you have your heart broken or when, I mean, I don't, I wish I'd counted how many first dates I went on because I think that would be very helpful <laughs> to just encourage people to know, like, I know you've had 70 first dates in the last couple of years. If it's worth pursuing it, it's worth going through the trenches to get it. And these are, again, I mean, so many mindset tricks that, that I had to had to use on myself as a psychologist. One that I that I would tell myself, Kylie, which I it was really, I don't know when I heard this in my dating journey, but I remember because sometimes when you're you're out date after date after date and it's not working, or you date for a couple, a couple months here and there, and it's still not coming together, you can get so demoralized. I remember at one point someone told me, you know, it only takes one to be the one. And that took the pressure off in a way because I don't know what else. I mean, it, obviously that's it's so basic, but for some reason you get to this point where it's like, I have to figure out how to date this person and this person. And, and actually, no, I have to figure out how to show up as me, mm -hmm. authentic to who I am, open to, yeah, I, I do re recommend having some list-ish uh, in your mind of what you want because that helps you weed out and as you and I have talked about before too on podcasts, the values that you possess are one of the most critical elements of your connection. And so to know your values, which is that self-awareness to understand who you are, it'll help you weed out because you might be like, this guy's so hot, but I can tell because he mentioned that he kind of told a white lie here and he 
He's not afraid to call in sick, sick when he's not sick to work 25 days a year. You're like, I'm a person who values integrity and honesty. So this is going to work, though he is hot. It helps you have that that clarity that you need when you're essentially trying to ascertain if it's a fit in the midst of trying to have a good time, too. Right. So so things like that, I think, to get some brass tacks for when you're in the trenches to try to stay hopeful. I think about my dating journey and some of the things that I anchored to. One, I tried to be as objective as possible. So outlining what I wanted in a relationship was super helpful, like you said, in remaining objective to Mm -hmm. the list. And it's not like I was super attached to every line item on that list. And if one item on there was not you know, a box check, then it's a deal breaker. I identified the deal breakers. And then I identified some like nice to haves, but not need to have Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in this person. And so then when I, I saw exactly like you said, what I would call yellow flags, I would address them and determine whether or not it was going to be a red flag or if the yellow flag was diffused and the flag went down, it's like, okay, I can proceed just with a little bit of, of caution or vigilance. And That helped me stay objective in my process. Now, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on maintaining a mindset of abundance. Mm. Yeah, no, that's such a good point because so often you'll hear all the good ones are taken. Yes. And that is something that people can get into a mindset. But you spoke to it earlier in our conversation, and it has to do with the cognitive biases that we approach life through. And it's very oftentimes that if I'm, like you said, if I believe all the good ones are taken, I'm throwing that kind of energy out into the world. I'm walking into that coffee shop. I'm walking into that party, assuming that any guy that I might find attractive is definitely gonna be taken. And that's just not true. It's a lie. So getting back to being impeccable with our words, it's a lie. All the good ones are not taken. And frankly, as was my experience, (laughs) there was a really good one who was taken for a while, but when we met, he was recently not taken. So we have to remember that life is long, relationships ebb and flow. And especially for women who got to be in their late 30s, early 40s like me, listen, there's going to be a guy who got married young, wasn't the right fit, stayed with it for the kids. And then when it's appropriate time, it's like, you know, this isn't working anymore. So let's part ways. And now he is enthusiastically excited to meet that really strong fit that he didn't have before with the maturity that comes through going through a divorce, that would be something that maybe wouldn't be on someone's list. Like, I want to be the second wife. I want to marry the divorce guy. We can reframe that to being a positive. And so to your point of just trying to recognize that that mindset of assuming that all the good ones are taken or assuming that there's no one left for me, that there's a limited number of people I can be with or that are available to me, that is going to frame your entire approach in a negative way. And we know, depending on where you are with law of attraction type stuff, what we throw out there comes back to us. It's just the way that the world works. Yeah. I'm curious to know, do you recommend, and maybe the answer is it depends, but do you recommend for those people who are swiping in on the apps Talk to as many people as you want or you can or focus on one at a time and move on. That's a tricky question to your point. it's It probably depends, but I think ultimately what can happen, I think definitely people feel this way, that they go out, they have a nice date, and then it's like, well, she was cute and nice and she was intelligent and funny, but here's my phone and here's my app. I can find someone just a little cuter, just a little nicer. Just So I think it's harder for people to commit now because, and, and this is the irony of what we were just talking about, some people feel that there's so much abundance of opportunity, of potential partners that they can maybe, and I hear this from the single women I've worked with, that they feel that they can't get any traction mm-hmm. and they can't get the dating relationship to really get even those first couple months of just, let's see if there's something here to develop because okay, one little comment and he bounces back on the apps. So that's a tricky one, Kylie. But I think I would recommend trying to focus a bit, (laughs) giving someone a chance, Mm -hmm. having your deal breakers in place, but also being open to the, the possibility that some of those that aren't deal breakers, those qualities, like 
like Dan, my husband, he was recently divorced when we met. And as a psychologist, I thought, well, as any, as a human being, I thought, okay, I don't want to be the rebound girl. He was married for 23 years. So I proceeded with caution, but just because I was like, well, this isn't ideal to have a very recent divorce. And I probably could be the, the rebound girl. I didn't write it off immediately either. I proceeded yeah. with caution. I continued yeah. to gather information. I continued to see other people because I'm not putting all my eggs in one basket just because mm -hmm. we had a great first date. Those are the kind of processes that I think that can be very helpful in the yeah. dating process. Yeah. Oh, I think that's so good. Okay. Another trend I see a lot of times we say we want a long term, steady, consistent relationship, but then we keep going back to a familiar pattern with either men or women who are not committed. They are just constantly playing the field. They're not really interested in settling down, but that seems to be what we're attracting, even though we say we want something different. Mm -hmm. What do you think is going on there? It could be some kind of psych 101 stuff where, I mean, that the pattern that you just described could be someone who had an unavailable, like a father who took, I'm thinking of a woman now, a father who took off and was never attentive, the emotionally unavailable. So we call this the recapitulation of family of origin issues. So in my adult life, I recapitulate, I reenact what didn't work out for me as a child, hoping to correct it in adulthood. Ooh. Dad was emotionally unavailable to me, didn't meet my emotional needs as a young girl. So now in adulthood, I, I will be attracted to someone who's also emotionally unavailable and I'll fix what happened in my childhood by getting this guy to love me. Never works, of course. <laughs> It, that could be what's going on. I think that also one of the, the trouble spots that I think is very hard, and I think this is where you have to start working with a coach or with a therapist, is when you find yourself only attracted to people who aren't good for you. Mm. And, and guys feel this a lot. I'm a nice guy. I'm a good guy. I provide. I, I'm successful. And I try to connect with a girl, and she's attracted to this bad boy. Yeah. And that's hard for everyone involved. <laughs> It's hard for a woman who goes, I really, like you said, I want to change this pattern. This is what I want. I want stability. And again, it, 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 but I can't find, you know, I can't be attracted to the nice guy and I don't want to, I can't fake it. I can't like force myself to be attracted to someone. That's a very real experience, but it gets back to retraining our brain. I like to say security is sexy. <laughs> I like to say that. Yeah. Tell yourself that what you want is attractive. If you find yourself like I'm always going for the vagabond or for the guy that won't settle down and you're saying, I want security, I want stability, I want someone who will commit to me, then you need to tell your brain <laughs> to find that attractive. And we know, as we've talked about extensively today, it will rewire. I believe that. I know that it's true because I, as, as a younger woman, found, I mean, my father was a musician. He was a professor, so he was stable, but he was a jazz musician. So had that. So I, I had those seasons of going for the more artistic type, the more bohemian type. And as I realized, like, these aren't serving me in the end. Yeah, it was, it was fun for a time, but this is not the kind of person I want to build a life with. It's the kind of person that I can count on when things are rough. So you need to rewire your brain. And again, working with someone like you, working with someone like me, working with a therapist, that's the way to move through that. It may be involving going through some childhood stuff, but I don't want anyone, again, as we've talked about today, to think, oh, I went through that in childhood. That means I'm destined to mm -hmm. always be seeking unavailable attachments. Oh, so good. This is such great advice. Now, I want to just ask one final question because I know we're coming up on time and this has been such an awesome conversation. Why is anxiety a good thing? Anxiety is a great thing because it is protective. So when we feel anxiety, it's because it matters. I'm giving a talk tomorrow. I'm a little nervous about it already, even though I, I public speaking is my thing. Mm -hmm. But it, I, I'm a little nervous because it matters. And anxiety is protective also because if I'm out in the woods and it's dark night, or let's just make it more real, like living in Chicago, when I would come home late in the evening, and sometimes I had to park far away from my apartment, I had a little anxiety because, and that's good. Because my 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 system is saying, hey, Karen, you're in a potentially threatening situation. Let's like not be on my phone. Let's be looking around. Sometimes I would even have like 911, like keyed up on my phone and ready to press hit because I it's rough in the city. 
so anxiety is protective. And when we can see it as our friend, kind of getting back to what Dr. Hayes talks about, where we can see these voices, even the, the voices, I'm not talking about having multiple psychotic voices in your head, but these thoughts that are, it's feel like voices in our head. And we can see even the negative ones. Is there a way to see that as being protective? That anxious thought, can I get objective about it? Like you said, maybe put it in the third person, as you mentioned, give it a name, the mean girl. Can we see it as trying to protect us? And so we don't fight against that anxiety so much because when we put all that energy in, in fighting it, unless we're going to dispute it with a nice rational thought, replacing it with that, like as the REBT model suggests, when we can see it as protective, as trying to help us, we can see, again, feel more holistic, more integrated and know, listen, my emotions are here to serve me. If mm -hmm. I can figure out ways to move through them, manage them and let them be a part of that holistic experience of thriving instead of, like you said, just surviving. I think that's so good. And I also think that a lot of times the anxiety I felt in dating was giving me cues that these guys were not right for me. Oh, for sure. And it's like, why am I ignoring those? And it's it's like, I think the movie was he's just not that into you. Yes. When when they talked about, you're the exception, not the rule. And it's like, no, you are the rule, not the exception a lot right. of times. But I would say, oh, he's not texting me back because he's just busy or whatever, whatever, and make up excuses. And nowadays it's like, no, everybody's on their phone constantly throughout the day. If I haven't heard back from somebody after a day, it's, because they checked the message and either they had an ADHD moment and forgot to respond back or they just don't care enough to. Kylie, that's one of my go-to books because that book, the movie was based on a book called, oh. he's just, yeah, he's just not that into you. It was written by a guy and his wife who, the guy was one of the writers for Sex and the City. Ooh. So it, yeah, and actually that's there's an episode about that where Carrie's boyfriend, Berger, tells Miranda, she's like, sitting down like this guy da, 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 and exactly to your point and he hasn't texted back or I guess it was called back at that point and so the girls come up with all these excuses he's intimidated by you because you're a lawyer he did it and the guy's like no he's just not that into you and Carrie's all mad at him but the book is it's amazing because he experienced that in his dating life and now he's with his wife who had been married to a man before who felt that she married a man who wasn't that into her so this is not just for the dating realm. This takes us into relationships. If we establish, what does Dr. Phil say? You teach people the way to treat you. If you establish those mm -hmm. patterns where it's okay, and this gets back to anxiety and even to anxious attachment, like we talked about a moment ago. A lot of women are in relationships with men who are emotionally unavailable, and they're not being treated properly. Even in the early days of dating, they're not having re reciprocity in communication with texting and so forth. And they're going, Oh, I don't know. I just have anxious attachment. It's like, no, you're just not being treated right. To your point, this right. is a sign. This is again, anxiety protecting you saying this isn't a fit. Yeah. And and you're not going to change him and he shouldn't change you. So this is just, that's what dating is to figure out if you're a fit to gather information and you don't have to pathologize it. Well, yeah, I have this anxious attachment. Actually, you just continue to date people who are not maybe ready to have a, a, a committed relationship or if they're just not that into you, let's just, you've gathered the information you need and let's move on to find someone who can be a good fit for you. Let's mm -hmm. not label everything as, as anxious attachment. Let's just look for that healthy connection that we all want. Yeah. And I, I experienced that where I had, I was dating a guy that was very non-responsive and I just kept comparing him to my soulmate. And I kept thinking in my head, would my soulmate not text mm -hmm. me back for 10 hours? Or would my soulmate be excited to respond back to me and ask me how my day is going? And as soon as I started dating Chris, it was like all of my anxiety disappeared. And he did everything. He did everything to demonstrate to me that he just wanted to be around me all the time. He genuinely enjoyed my company. He liked talking to me. And every time we hung out, we had another date to hang out on the calendar. And like, there was never a time where I was like, well, I wonder if I'm going to see him again. It was always, oh, I know I'm going to see him tonight because we made dinner plans. Or I know I'm going to see him tomorrow 
after he gets back from his work trip. And oh, by the way, he called me while he was in Dallas on his work trip. And now I don't have to worry about what he's doing or if he's roaming the streets of Texas, like doing things he shouldn't be doing or, you know, making mistakes. And like, I never had any of those concerns because he, he acted like my soulmate. And that was what I kept comparing him against. And it was an objective comparison to where then it helped me decide what my standard really was. How did I want to be treated? And is he fulfilling that? And always it was yes. And he's going above and beyond the expectation that I ever had. And showing me that like Mr. Prince Charming actually does exist. And how cool is it that I found him? I love that. I've never heard of that idea per se, comparing how you're being treated, even in those early days of connection to your soulmate. I love that. And, but I can so resonate with what you're saying, Kylie, that when you meet the right person, and this is the thing when you're young and when you're in high school and you go, mom, how will I know when I met the one? And she's like, well, you'll just know. And you're like, that does not help. Right. <laughs> and as someone who almost married the wrong person, yes. it's, it's a little nebulous. So I get, but that, that helps concretize it. This is what I want. This is how I want to feel. This is how I want to be treated. Have that as your, your metric. But getting to your point as well, when you meet the right person, the things that were a struggle in other relationships where you felt like a little needy sometimes, or I wanted more communication and I didn't get it the right person, it's, it's so easy. I wrote a song for Dan called breathing because he had said to his sister, I overheard him when we were first married. He's like, being with Karen is so easy. It's like breathing. It will be easier than you can ever imagine. I know someone who's out there in the trenches and like hurting or just is like, I don't believe it. Get, get, get your mind straight, girl. Yeah. Get, get your mind straight, gentlemen, because it will be easier than you ever believed. Yes. It'll be fluid. It will surprise you. I, one of the lines from the song is you were more than I'd ever dared to dream. Like, and I had high hopes. I was a romantic and I called off a wedding because it wasn't the right fit. And I, once you go through that, you're like, all right, if it's not like top shelf guy, like epic type of connection, I'm not going to do it. Like I I'm happy single. I'll be okay. Yes. But once you make that, make that decision and you find it, it's extraordinary. And it's still to this day, easy. And you have ex-wife and, and stepkids and the same. But those things that look challenging on paper, when you're with the right partner, it's easier than you can ever imagine. So I want to yes, offer 100%. that word of hope. Oh, that's so good. And I wish more people realize that that once in a lifetime love does exist. Yeah. And you deserve it. Yes. We all deserve it. Yes. And Kylie, I do, for anyone who's in this space, I do want to just a little self-promotion with my book. Again, I mentioned it earlier, Singles and New Black, Don't Wear White Till It's Right, because it came from my experience of being disappointed time and time again, and then starting to struggle, trying to get my mind right. Like, do I really believe in that once in a lifetime love like you talked about? And then being told, well, I'm, I need to change probably. There's something flawed with me, right? Because I'm the common denominator. And that's mm -hmm. easy to believe. And as single women, sometimes we take that. We're like, well, what's the problem? Let me fix it. Because that feels like if I can fix the problem, then I'll meet the guy. But I in there, and that's not a bad approach to be reflective and to take stock of your patterns and your habits and behaviors. But ultimately, the message that I want to offer is that it takes a lot of strength to wait for the right one. And you have a broken engagement in your past too. And once you do that, it takes a lot of strength and I want to give single women the reminder that you deserve, like you said, you deserve that epic love and you deserve that without having to become a fundamentally different person. You're not fundamentally flawed. It takes courage to wait for the right one. Don't settle because you will always regret, regret settling. You will never regret waiting for the right person, even if it does take a little bit longer than you anticipated. Totally agree. When you zoom out and think about finding your soulmate. It truly is like finding a needle in a haystack. And why do we expect that dating is going to be easy or quick? Like, why is that a thing? <laughs> and now that there are so many more complexities to life, it's going to take a lot more for you to find the person that perfectly aligns with you and your lifestyle and your values and your vision for your future. 
There's just a lot of things that have to fall into place. So when you think about it like that, it really shouldn't be something that you rush into or you think, you know, after one one date, this is this is it because you've gotten one data point on somebody and you need several data points to know, okay, my hypothesis of this guy could be the one or this gal could be the one has to get validated through several, maybe even thousands of data points. You know, one thing that that Chris and I both said when we first started dating is we need to be with each other through every season. We need to experience a whole year of life together before we're going to know with certainty that like we're in it to win it for the long haul because there's a lot of variables. I mean, just like you said, an ex-wife, kids, I have a, I had a dog. We now have two dogs together. I mean, and you think like a pet's no big deal, but like imagine if Chris had been allergic to the dogs. Like that would have been <laughs> a whole thing we had to deal with, right? There are so many factors that have to align. Stop approaching it in a hurry because it's just not how the world works and it's not what what it, it, it's just not a simple yes. It's it's a complex yes. And you have to take the time to explore and, and gather the information that you need to make a good decision. I completely agree. And working with women in the past, sometimes they do get excited if he's coming on strong. We know that, that the term that we're using now is love bombing. It can feel very, it, it can feel very heady at first. Like, oh my gosh, she's just so into me. That never worked for me because I was like, you don't know me yet. Yeah. I don't, you don't have those data points. Like, I'm glad that you think I'm cute. I'm glad that we had a nice first date. But when guys would come on too strong, I had the ab absolute opposite response because I was like, what that says to me is I'm a woman and I'm good enough because you've, you've learned enough in like the three hour date we have that I'll do. Like, I want someone who sees me and you cannot see me and get me in yeah. three hours. It's impossible. I want someone who is yeah, of course, attracted to me physically, but I want someone who loves my heart, loves my soul, loves my intellect, the way that I think, my values. That's impossible. Those data points are not available in limited time. And you're so, and so I'm always encouraging people to gather that information and don't see it as a compliment if he's all into you too quickly. It's not. He, he doesn't care about you because he doesn't know you. He just yeah. is into having the idea of having a woman in his life. Right. Ugh. I love this. This is so good. I think there are some really good tactical tools that we've talked about in this conversation. Anything else you think that our listeners should know, whether it's about anxiety or dating or anything related to resilience? To your point, resilience is really a core element of getting through life because life is going to throw you lots of curveballs, whether it's calling off an engagement like you and I have done or whether it's a global pandemic, which no one anticipated. Resilience is what separates the men from the boys, to use an old school expression. And when we think about tenacity and grit, and there's a lot of research going on in the psych literature right now about those qualities because we see it's not the people who have maybe on paper all the advantages from idyllic childhood or those sorts of things. It's really those character, the elements of, of integrity in their character that help them navigate the, the vicissitudes of life. And the takeaway message, what we're talking about today is that is something that if you sense in your life that you lack, you absolutely can develop. You can develop that resilience, which is going to permeate all of the prongs of your model that you utilize with your clients. And it's going to exponentially elevate your emotional well-being, your relationships, all your relationships, family, friendship, romantic. And it's going to move you from just getting by, from trying to survive to thriving in love and life. Thanks for listening to Redefining Resilience. To learn more about building your mental and physical readiness, check out odysseyresilience.org. And follow us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and TikTok.